For a vast majority of Aegon Targaryen's reign, it would be fair to call it peaceful. More so, his later years. The Maesters of the Citadel will come to know this time as the Dragon's Peace. But before this peace could be reached, there was the Dragon's Wars, a long series of bloody conflicts that tested Aegon's kingship. Although Aegon was crowned in the Starry Sept and named King, this still didn't mean Westeros was fully under his control. Many minor houses used the chaos of the conquest as a power grab. For example, the Lords of the Three Sisters declared themselves an independent nation from the Crown, with Maedy Marla of House Sunderland as Queen. With much of the Targaryen fleet destroyed in the conquest, Aegon commanded Lord Torrin Stark of Winterfell to quash the rebellion. Torrin sent Sir Warwick Manderley, and a force set out from White Harbour, ferried by Bravosi mercenary galleys. Both of Aegon's queens, his sisters, Rhaenys and Visenya Targaryen, joined Sir Warwick. Seeing the dragons in the skies, the rebels quickly rethought their position, and they deposed their queen in favour of her younger brother, Stephen Sunderland, promptly bent the knee to Queen Visenya, and gave her over his sons as hostages to ensure compliance. On the other side of Westeros, the Iron Islands were in chaos. After House Hall, the kings of the islands for centuries were extinguished in a single night, when Aegon descended from the skies atop Valerian the Black Dread and burned Harrenhal and the whole of House Hall in the process. The late king Harren the Black left a large power vacuum, with many descendants of the Black Line declaring themselves king of the islands. Fighting broke out across the isles as a result. The fighting only ended when Aegon and a war fleet appeared in 2 AC. The Ironborn put up little resistance. Tired of war, they welcomed the sight. Now came the issue of who would rule the Iron Islands in Aegon's name. Some suggested they should be vassalised by one of Aegon's wardens, either the Tullys, Lannisters, or even the Starks of Winterfell. But Aegon allowed them to choose their own lord. The Ironmen chose Vicon Greyjoy, Lord Reaper of Pike. Vicon pledged his fealty to Aegon and renounced the Ironborn's claims to the Riverlands, including Harrenhal. With the rebellions quelled, all the lands south of the Wall were now ruled by Aegon Targaryen and his sisters. All except Dawn. At first, Aegon tried to bring the Dornish under his control with diplomacy, but after Queen Rhaenys failed invasion and negotiation during the conquest, countless High Lords, Maesters and Septons treated with Princess Mira, the Yellow Toad of Dawn. But after almost a year, nothing was achieved. The First Dornish War began in 4 AC when Queen Rhaenys returned to Dawn, bringing fire and blood, as she had promised Princess Mira two years earlier. Atop Meraxis, she descended from the skies above Planky Town, setting the town ablaze. The whole mouth of the Green Blood River was choked with smoke that could be seen as far as Sunspear. The people of the floating town jumped into the river to escape the dragon flame, with fewer than 100 dying. Oris Baratheon also led 1,000 knights up the Boneway, while Aegon personally marched through the Prince's Pass with 30,000 men, with many High Lords joining him. Confidence was so high, Lord Harlan Tyrell, warded of the South, felt they had more than enough power to crush the Dornish, even without Aegon and Balerion. In a way, Harlan Tyrell was correct. They were the much superior force, but this theory would never be tested. Like years prior, the Dornish never offered battle. Instead, they withdrew and hid as Aegon neared, burning their crops and poisoning their wells. By the time Aegon's host reached the Dornish sands, supplies were already running low. He split his force, himself turning east to besiege Skyreach, while Harlan Tyrell headed south to Hellholt. With winter approaching, Aegon hoped the blazing Dornish heat would lessen, but dawn proved unrelenting. By the time Harlan reached Hellholt, he'd lost a quarter of his men, only to find the castle itself empty. Oris Brathian found himself in a similar situation. The horses found the steep and twisting paths of the mountains difficult. The Dornish drained boulders on them from above, something the Stormlanders never saw coming. At the crossing of the River Will, Dornish bowmen ambushed the column as they were crossing the bridge. Oris ordered a retreat, but a rockfall cut them off. With no escape, the Stormlanders were massacred. Only Oris and the Lords worth the ransom were spared, but found themselves captive of the savage mountain lords. The king had much more success than his lords. He took the castle of Skyreach and won Ironwood after a short siege. Lord Toland of Ghost Hill sent forth a champion to battle the king in single combat. Aegon accepted and slew the man, but discovered later that he was not the champion at all, but Lord Toland's fool. The lord himself had fled. Aegon descended upon Sunspear, only to find Mira Martell also vanished, and just his sister Rainy stood before him. After burning Planky Town, Rainy's had taken Lemonwood, Spotswood, and Stinkwater, but only finding old women and children 
with an actual enemy nowhere to be found. Even in Sunspear, those who had remained would not admit any knowledge of the location of the Dornish Lords or the Princess. All Aegon could do was declare victory. In the Great Hall at Sunspear, he gathered all the Dornish who remained and informed them they were now part of his realm and their former lords were now rebels, placing rewards on their heads. Lord Rosby was named Castilian of Sunspear and Warden of the Sands. Castilians were also named for the rest of the land and castles captured by Aegon. They had barely reached the capital before dawn erupted into chaos. Dornish spearmen appeared from nowhere like ghosts. Skyreach, Ironwood, Tor and Ghost Hall were all retaken within two weeks and the garrisons put to the sword. It's rumoured the Castilians and stewards were only killed after long torment. Lord Rosby had a kinder fate. After the recapture of Sunspear, he was thrown from a window by Princess Mira herself. Only Lord Tyrrell and his men remained, left by Aegon at Hellholt. But the fish from the river Brimstone were toxic due to the sulphur in the water, making the men from Highgarden sick. When news of the fall of Sunspear reached Hellholt, Lord Tyrrell gathered his remaining men and set off across the sands with the intent to take Vaith, march east across the river, and retake Sunspear. But somewhere east of Hellholt, amidst the red sands of dawn, Tyrrell and his whole army vanished. No man was ever seen again. Aegon Targaryen was not the kind of man to accept defeat. The war would drag slowly on for another seven years. However, after 6 AC, the fighting descended into a series of atrocities, raids, and retribution, broken up by long periods of inactivity, dozens of short-lived truces, murders, and assassinations. In 7 AC, Oris Baratheon, among other lords who had been taken captive, were ransomed back to King's Landing for their weight in gold, but on their return it had been found the sword hand of each man had been cut off, so they could never take up arms against Dawn again. As a reprisal, Aegon atop Valerian descended on the mountain fortress of Will, reducing most of their keeps and watchtowers to molten stone. The Dornish response came the next year, when Lord Fowler led a force into the Reach. Moving fast, burning a dozen villages, they captured the castle of Nightsong before the Lords of the Reach realised what was happening. When word eventually did reach Old Town, Lord Hightower sent his son Adam with a strong force to retake Nightsong. But it was a predictable move, and a second Dornish force, commanded by Sir Geoffrey Dane, came down from Starfall, to attack Old Town. Old Town itself was too well defended for Dane to take, so the Dornish burned the fields, farms and villages for 20 leagues around the city. Lord Hightower's younger son, Garman, was killed when trying to lead a counter-attack. When Adam Hightower did reach Nungsong, he found the garrison had been massacred, with the castle's lord, Lord Caron, his wife and children, all taken back to Dorne as captives. Adam decided to return to Old Town to relieve the defenders only to find Sir Joffrey Dane's forces gone. King Aegon flew to Highgarden to take counsel with his warden of the south, but the young lord, Theo Tyrell, was against the idea of another invasion after the fate of his father in the last attempt. Once again, the king unleashed the power of his dragons against the Dornish. Aegon himself fell upon Skyreach. Visenya and Vagar brought fire and blood to Starfall, the seat of House Dane, and Rhaenys and Meraxes returned to Hellholt, where tragedy struck. As Meraxes flew above Hellholt, a scorpion was fired from one of the castle towers. A yard-long bolt hit the queen's dragon in the right eye. Maraxis did not die instantly and came crashing down to the ground, destroying the tower and curtain wall of the castle. It is not known if Rhaenys Targaryen outlived Maraxis and remains a debated topic. Some say she fell from Maraxis to her death. Some that she was crushed by Maraxis on impact. Some accounts even claim she survived, only to die a slow, torturous death in the dungeon of the Ullers. The truth of the matter will likely never be known. All that can be said is Rhaenys Targaryen, sister and wife to King Aegon the Conqueror, died in 10 AC. The following two years would become known as the Dragon's Wrath. Every castle in Dawn was burned several times over by Beleriand and Vagar. The sands around Hellholt were fused into glass. The Dornish lords hid away, but even that did not provide safety. Lord Fowler, Lord Vaith and Lord Toland and four successive lords of Hellholt were murdered, one after the other. Aegon had put a lord's ransom on the head of any Dornish lord. Only two killers lived long enough to collect their reward, as the Dornish repaid blood with blood. Lord Conanton of Griffin's Roost was killed whilst hunting. Lord Mertens of Mistwood poisoned with his whole household. Lord Fell smothered in a brothel in King's Landing. By now, Dawn was nothing but a smoking desert hit by famine and plague, yet House Martell lived up to their words. 
I'm bowed, I'm bent, I'm broken. A captured dawnless knight fought before Queen Visenya insisted Princess Mira would rather see her people dead than slaves of the Dragon Lords. Visenya is reported to have said her brother would be glad to oblige. Time did what dragons could not, and in 13 AC, Mira Martell, the Yellow Toad of Dawn, died. Her son, Nymor, became Lord of Sunspear and Prince of Dawn at 60 years of age his health already in decline. Nymor did not have the appetite for further bloodshed. His first act was to send a delegation, along with the skull of the dragon Moraxis, to offer terms of peace to Aegon. He sent his own daughter and heir, Deria, to lead the delegation. Nymor's offer of peace was faced with fierce opposition in King's Landing. Queen Visenya was one of these opponents. She declared no peace without submission, and much of the King's Council echoed her words. Horace Baratheon, who was bitter towards Dawn in his later years, suggested they should send Daria Martell back to Dawn, missing a hand much like he was. Aegon would not hear such proposals, as Daria had come as an envoy under a banner of peace and vowed no harm would come to her under his care. King Aegon had also grown weary of bloodshed, but agreeing to peace without submission would be tantamount to saying his beloved sister and wife Rhaenys had died for nothing. His small council also warned Aegon, agreeing to peace would be seen as weakness and would spark rebellions they would have to put down. The Reach and Stormlands had suffered greatly and would never forgive or forget. The king was at the point of refusing the Dornish peace offer. It was only when any chance of peace seemed lost, Princess Daria presented the king with a letter from her father, telling the king the letter was for his eyes only. Aegon read the letter in open court, stone-faced and silent, seated on the Iron Throne. When he rose, it said his hands were dripping with blood. He burned the letter and never spoke of it again. That night, he mounted Balerion and flew alone to the Targaryen ancestral home of Dragonstone. He returned to the Aegon Fort the next morning and agreed to the terms of peace offered by Nymor. No one could be sure what was in the letter. Some say it was a simple plea from one father to another whose words touched the king's heart, or it was the burden of the deaths of the noble knights who lost their lives for him. Some have suggested the letter was actually written by Mira Martell before her death, using a vial of Queen Rainey's blood as ink. Years after the fact, Grand Maester Clegg concluded Dawn no longer had the strength to fight, and in desperation, no more threatened that if Aegon refused, he would engage the faceless men of Bravos to kill Aegon's only son and heir. Queen Rhaenys' boy, who was only six years old, but only two people ever knew the truth, King Aegon and Prince Nymor. The First Dornish War lasted from 4 AC to 13 AC. Mira Martell had done what Harren the Black, two kings, and Torrhen Stark could not. She withstood Aegon and his dragons. However, north of the Red Mountains, her tactics were scorned, and the term Dornish Courage became a mocking name for cowardice. The Dornish War would be Aegon the Conqueror's last.